Good morning and welcome to all of you who are joining us here this morning and for those of you who are watching online at home and joining us there, uh, you know, just want to welcome you to our service today. We're glad that you are joining us no matter where you are. And uh, maybe it's not Sunday morning, maybe it's later on or sometime this week, um, but thanks for tuning in and thanks for picking up our service. And we just invite you to worship with us now as we sing out these songs of praise uh, to our Savior and King, for He is worthy of our praise this morning. So would you lift your voices with us today as we worship him?
We thank you that you marched up that hill to Calvary. Lord, that you paid the price that we all know. Lord, that you took our debt upon yourself, Jesus, and in return gave us salvation, gave us freedom, gave us life. So all to you we owe, Jesus, for who you are, for what you've done. So, Lord, we come and we focus our eyes on the cross this morning, Lord, to remember what you have done for us, Lord. Lord, to thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, for the gift of salvation that you have given to us. So we just worship you now. Lord, we bow down before you with our songs of praise. Lord, that you would be honored and glorified. That your name would be lifted up. We thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Here's a place 
The emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. See, it was the, the persecution that he experienced that led him to, to, to pen the words to this beloved hymn. Um, and so uh, he, he reflected on the fact of Jesus on the cross. He saw Jesus and the cross as inseparable in his life. And uh, he wrote the song to make a statement about the commitment that he had to Christ and to this cross uh, that was the object of scorn for people. Uh, later on, he traveled uh, with a, a man by the name of Ed uh, Miris from Chicago to Sturgeon Bay in Wisconsin where they held evangelistic meetings at the Friends Church from December 29, 1912 to January 12, 1913. During these meetings, he finished the verses to the Old Rugged Cross. And on the last night of the meeting, um, he and Miris performed in this duet before the crowd. Um, and so this hymn, of course, was published uh, first in hymn book in 1915, so just over 100 years ago. And it was po made popular as well, a local connection was made popular through uh, the Billy Sunday Evangelistic Association. And so uh, right here in Scranton, in fact, just over 100 years ago, there was a Billy Sunday crusade uh, down by where the uh, giant plaza is, right down here in Green Ridge, <clears throat> that actually uh, got snowed in. Uh, the people that were there had to stay overnight, and uh, Billy Sunday came through the area. I have to believe that Billy Sunday at that time uh, affected many of our our uh, founding members of this church and of the Hamlin Assembly uh, in that in those meetings that they had. Uh, that perhaps, perhaps and, and most likely, they sang this song, "The Ordered Cross," at that time. And how incredible is that? Um, if, since then, uh, this song, The Old Rugged Cross, has been recorded by a number of recording artists. Now, there's been gospel groups galore that have done this song. But in addition to that, it's been recorded to, not by, but not limited to, these artists. And you might have heard of some of them. Alan Jackson uh, has a very popular version of this song. The group Alabama, not the state, but the group Alabama. Uh, Reverend Al Green, uh, another guy you might have heard of, another a former Assemblies of God member, Elvis. Uh, did a recording of this song. Amy Grant did a recording. Brad Paisley, Mercy Meat, Tennessee Ernie Ford, Willie Nelson, and Waylon Jennings, Johnny Cash, and none other than John Mellencamp actually did a version of this song. Uh, of course, the Gaithers and many uh, Christian artists have done this as well uh, through these years. So this morning we're going to talk about uh, this cross, this old rugged cross, as we look at the uh, the old rugged cross, maybe from the perspective of the George Bernard. Uh, listened uh, and, uh, and, and admired the cross as well, made him write this song. And then at the end of the service, we'll get a chance to sing a couple verses of that hymn. So I hope you stay with us and join us for that. So uh, the first thing I want to talk about is the silliness of the cross, the silliness or the foolishness of the cross, or is it the power of the cross that we look at? See, there's sort of two different perspectives on the cross today. There are those who believe that the, the message of the cross is foolishness and silliness. And then there are those who believe that the message of the cross is full of power. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verse 18, uh, the Apostle Paul writes and he says, The word of the cross, the message of the cross, is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And so this message of the cross, this idea of the cross, to the world, it's looked at as a foolishness, as a silliness, as, as something that has no warrant to it whatsoever. But to those of us who are being saved, the cross is the power of God in our lives. And so my question for you this morning is, what is it to you? What is the cross to you? What does it mean to you? How important is this message of the cross? And if it is important, you know, uh, <clears throat> is it important to you just for yourself? Or do you understand that the message of the cross is available for all mankind? You know, no matter what, where you go, no matter what culture you go into, the cross is held high. Uh, now, to some, it's held high in disdain, and to others, it's held high in incredible uh, power in their lives. Uh, and uh, as we read this past week in our Bible reading, as we were in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 5, that chapter ends up with this question. And I love this question. It's a preaching question where Jeremiah, the Holy Spirit, speaks to him through him. 
to the people of Judah in chapter 5, verse 31, and he ends on this question, what will you do in the end? Let me tell you something. No matter what you do, if you don't have the message of the cross, if you don't have the cross, your end is not a good end. But I'm thankful that in the end, I have the cross to fall back on. I have the cross that has brought power into my life, salvation in my life. And even uh, today in our church service here, in person, uh, you know, we'll be pausing to, to pause for communion, to remember the cross uh, of what Jesus did for us on that cross. In Romans chapter 1, Paul begins his, his epistle to the Romans by stating that he was not ashamed, he wasn't ashamed of the message of the cross. He says this in verse 16 and 17, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from the first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So we are not ashamed of this incredible message of the cross, this gospel, that Jesus died on the cross for us. It's not silliness to us. It's not foolishness to us. We lift high the cross and hold it up in the way that it should be, and we're not ashamed of that cross. So not only do we look at the foolishness of the cross, or the silliness of the cross, or truly the power of the cross, but we also look at the substitutionary work of Christ on the cross. This is a big word, substitutionary. In other words, Jesus took our place on the cross. We should have gone to the cross. We should suffer for our sins, but Christ took upon himself our suffering through the cross. The concept, and this is this sort of isolates people today because the concept that something someone did 2,000 years ago can have an effect on you today is looked at as, as being trivial. It's looked at as being nonsensical. But we understand that God de uh, demanded justice for sin, and so I, someone has to pay. And so it's, it's either each of us pay, or the perfect Son of God, the holy, blameless Lamb of God that came into this world took upon himself our punishment and our sin on the cross. Jesus takes our place on the cross. Peter writes about this in 1 Peter chapter 3, and he says in verse 18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. So we see that on the cross, Jesus takes our punishment that we deserve for our sin. He didn't deserve to die, but he willingly took our place and he experienced death for us. His death was a substitution. It was the righteous for the unrighteous. It was the innocent for the guilty. It was the perfect for the corrupt. So Christ substitutes himself for us in punishment. He bore it on his life for us. The theological terms concerning this that we talk of here in, in theology and Christianity are things like Christ is our propitiation. Christ is our propitiation. That's a big, long word that has an incredible meaning to it. He's our sacrifice. He's our redemption. He's our reconciliation. And He is our justification. So the work of the cross was a work of all those things. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, John says that He is the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Christ was that sacrifice. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. See, Jesus took upon himself all of the world's sin, all of our sins, everything he could possibly do. He bore it on his own body on the cross for us. He paid a debt he did not owe. We owed a debt he could not pay. And Christ paid it for us. That's why we love the cross. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter goes on and he says this in verse 21, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die in sins and live for righteousness. See, Jesus bore our sins. He took upon himself our sin on the cross, which is why the message of the cross to us is a powerful message. It's not a message of, of defeat. It's a message of victory. Christ bore our sins for us. That's why the songwriter a few years back 
back in the 1970s, um, was inspired by God at age 14 at a Memorial Day picnic to write these incredible words in a song. And he said this, The blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary, the blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. For it reaches to the highest mountain, it flows to the lowest valley, the blood that gives me strength from day to day will never lose its power. It soothes my doubts and it calms my fears and it dries all my tears. The blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. Andre Crouch wrote that about the power of the cross in our lives. At age 14, at a piano, at a Memorial Day picnic, the Holy Spirit inspired him to write such incredible words. The power of the cross. We're not ashamed of that incredible power. It's the substitutionary work of Christ on the cross for us. Thirdly, we talk about the scorn of the cross. The scorn of the cross. You know, uh, even today, it's fine if the cross is shiny or pretty. We're all about that. You know, we wear it as a necklace. We wear it, you know, on a, on a t-shirt. We wear it on a hat. You know, we carry a cross in our pocket. Whatever the case may be, in our church, we have beautiful crosses all over the place. You know, on our doors, on the steeple, projected up on the wall here. It's pretty. The cross is a beautiful thing to us. But the reality is the cross itself is an instrument of death. There's a scorn that's attached to the cross as well. Uh, to us as people of the cross, there are those who actually have disdain towards us in this world because we are people of the cross. Um, you know, the current narrative, and this is happening. You've got you to pay attention to listen to what's happening. You know, um, even what's happening with COVID in our society. It's interesting. I read a lot of blogs and blogs, and, and, and I, I, I can sense a change in what people are saying about Christians through this. Um, and, and some of that, uh, some of that uh, uh, disdain that people have towards Christians is brought on by Christians. Um, but it's, it, you know, what I hear now, the narrative that's being pushed now, like, like somebody asked the question, like, why is it that in the nation of China where there's so many more people than the United States, you know, the, the disease really hasn't taken a toll like it has in the United States here, you know, and, and so a lot of the answers I'm hearing from people are that, well, China believes in science, whereas in the United States, we believe in God. And see, there is this storm that is starting to come towards the people of God for the beliefs that we have. Now listen, I, uh, uh, as, a, as a Christian, we believe in science too. How, how many of you know science changes from day to day? You know, what's true? Eggs were bad for me when I was growing up. Don't eat eggs, they're terrible. You know, the cholesterol will kill you. Now eat eggs more, you know? I mean, listen, science changes. Um, the Word of God remains the same. Uh, so we don't deny science in, in, in Christian circles. Um, I, I count myself to be somewhat of a scientist. I love science. I love the sciences. Um, you know, but, but it doesn't negate you as a Christian to, to believe in science. Um, how many of you know the narrative that, that we've been told about this disease has changed hundreds of times? So what's true about any of it? What's the real science behind this? Nobody really knows. But you can sense that there's a storm that people are pushing towards believers today. You know, and some believers have flaunted, you know, uh, in a silly way, their faith. You know, um, and so you know, uh, we have to be careful with that kind of thing. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, the writer to the Hebrews talks about the scorn of the cross, this scorn for following and believing Jesus. In verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. <clears throat> Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you won't grow weary and lose heart. So it says that Jesus endured the cross. There was an endurance, an enduring, that he had to have at the cross. He had to stay on the cross. You know, Another songwriter wrote a number of uh, you know, a generation ago, he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set it free. He could have come down from the cross and shown himself to be God, yet he chose to endure it and to suffer the scorn of it. <clears throat> and so 
of the writer there in verse 3 tells us that we're to consider, you know, how Jesus suffered with the cross and endured it and scorned the shame so that we don't lose heart when the same thing happens to us. <clears throat> the shameful public humiliation that Jesus had through the cross, the death of the crucified criminal, was a, it was a very public death. Everything from that person was taken away. Uh, many times they were, they were put on the cross naked with nothing on. And so Jesus suffered, even though, you know, uh, his undergarment might have been left on. It didn't leave much to, you know, uh, to, you know, for the imagination. And so many times criminals were, uh, were hung naked on the cross. And so it was a very scornful thing. And it seems like so often today, um, maybe for the cross we suffer persecution for that. But know that, listen, we have to consider that Jesus was persecuted too, that Jesus suffered. And so as you suffer, we know that we're suffering with our Savior. He suffers with us um, for the cause of Christ. Uh, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount talks about this. And he says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And you know, I think in, in this day and age in America, where we're so focused on those who have been wronged, we forget that sorry, nobody should be wronged. But there are those in our world today, our brothers and sisters, all around our world, that are being hotly persecuted, persecuted to the point of death for the cause of Christ. And, and uh, I'm not saying we shouldn't stand up for justice here, but folks, there's such injustice in this world. Our brothers and sisters that are suffering all around this world. In Nigeria today, our black African brothers and sisters are being persecuted terribly for the cause of Christ. Where is the American church? Where are the people in America demanding justice for them? They're losing everything for the cause of Christ. In Sudan, in sub-Saharan Africa, many black Christians are being persecuted to the point of even being crucified for the cause of Christ. In Northern Africa, uh, in, in, uh, in Muslim Northern Africa, uh, I still see the picture in my mind of those 21 Christians marched onto the beach in Libya in those orange jumpsuits, and they lost their heads for the gospel. What did they do? When, before they were killed, they were encouraging each other, brother, stay strong, stay strong, keep your faith in Christ, before their heads were mercilessly cut off by those Muslim attackers to them. Listen, there's a great persecution that's happening in Asia today. In China, um, <clears throat> the church is being cracked down on. Yes, China is cracking down on its Muslim minority as well. But there's a large church in China that is being persecuted by the nation of China. I know this isn't going to score points well today with the political correctness. But there are people in China uh, who, are, who are dirt poor where the government is coming in and saying, we're going to cut off all aid to your home. If you don't take down every reference of Jesus in your home. So listen, old lady, if you want to still get this aid from the government, take down the pictures of Jesus. There's persecution happening all around the world today. And there is still a suffering that takes place with the cross. And in America, we whine about the suffering we take. We, we have to suffer. Let me tell you, it's nothing compared to the rest of the world. We need to take a stand for our brothers and sisters around this world that are being, that are being persecuted so greatly. <clears throat> Our brothers and sisters in the state of California have been told they can't meet in churches. You can go to a bar, you can have a protest, but you can't meet in a church. I'm thankful. Do you know what's happening in California today? They're going outside. They're having meetings outside. They're having concerts out on the beach. People are getting saved and baptized right there. Uh, listen, you cannot stop this. The work of God is going forward powerfully all around this world. You know, but there's a, there's a suffering that will, be, that will bear for this. About a century and a half ago, there was a revival. There was a, well, a little over a century ago. There was a revival uh, in the nation uh, of Wales. As a result of this, of this revival, uh, many missionaries went out all around the world from, from Wales. And there was a number of missionaries who went to the, to the subcontinent of India. And uh, some of those missionaries that went, uh, went up into the hills in the northeastern part of the, of the nation of India. Uh, the region there um, was a, a violent region in the Assam region of uh, northeastern India. Uh, and a missionary went and, and went to a village there in Assam, and in the Goa Hills section of Assam. And uh, he began to preach the gospel. And uh, the chieftain in that village threatened the man who was preaching. But a family uh, from that village received Christ as Savior. 
And so the, the chieftain of that village decided that he was going to make an example of this family. So he brought the man and his wife and his children uh, to, the, to the village square, and he, he threatened the man to renounce his faith in Christ. And he said, if you do not renounce your faith in Christ, um, we're going to uh, kill your family. And uh, he, he calls this family into this place, and the public comes around him, and the man responds uh, uh, to the village chieftain, and he said, I have decided to follow Jesus. I cannot turn back. So the village chieftain orders the man's children to be killed. So they took arrows and they shot the man's children in front of him. And the children lay dying on the ground. And, and the chieftain said to the man, <clears throat> Would you renounce your Jesus now? Would you stop serving Jesus? And the man replied, he said, Though none go with me, still I will follow. I cannot turn back. And the chieftain said to the man, he said, Listen, you've lost your, your, your children. We're going to take your wife from you if you don't renounce your faith in Christ. And the man's answer to him was, though none go with me, still I will follow. The cross behind, before me, the world behind me. No turning back. They killed the man's wife, and ultimately they killed the man. His, his death was witnessed by all the people in the village. One by one, the people in the village started to turn their faith to Christ. Eventually, the chieftain of that village professed his faith in Christ. And of course, those words were recorded and written down in a song. It was made very popular by the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Uh, the melody is a Indian melody. It's entitled The Psalm After the Region where the text originated. And the story of that song is that the message of the cross is not a message of foolishness, it's a message of power for us today. And finally this morning, uh, we see that uh, we will be persecuted for following Christ. In, 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 uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says, that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and insults and hardships in persecutions and difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. The reality is persecution will come our way. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul tells us, he tells his young understudy Timothy, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Our persecution may not be to the point of death, but persecution still comes. Even if it's self-inflicted persecution that we have to go through to deny ourselves, and die daily to follow Christ. In John chapter 15, Jesus says, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Our goal is not to, to uh, achieve friendship with the world. It's so that the world can come to know the Savior. <clears throat> you know, we're not here for the preference of this world. We're here for a purpose, to bring the gospel into this world. And listen, brother or sister, if you're a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, and you feel... Like, you know, you're not really doing much for Christ. There's a world out there that needs to hear about Jesus. What part are you doing to see that take place? I want you to know, <clears throat> every dollar you give in offering here, um, a portion of that, of that dollar goes to missions. There are missionaries all around the world that we support. Uh, you know, uh, we are doing our best to, broad, uh, to, to record this recording, to broadcast it so that it has some quality. Listen, find some people around you that don't know Jesus and offer to have a watch party with them about one of our videos. That's great if you can do it with, you know, Jimmy Swagger, you can do it with, um, you know, um, with some great big national minister and everything. But why not sit down and have them watch a video from your own church and then somehow come to know Jesus uh, right here, uh, right here in Scranton, you know, and let them be part of something that can really transform their life and change their life. If you aren't participating in that, maybe you're not experiencing that kind of persecution you should have because you're not truly following Christ with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. If all you're doing is coming to church and sitting in church, man, there's more for you than just that. Come and follow Jesus. Finally, we looked this morning um, at the boasting of the cross. See, the story of the cross doesn't stop us. It doesn't prevent us um, because we, like Jesus, can look at the joy that's set before us. And so even though following Christ costs us something, we can look beyond and see the joy that God has for us as well. The boasting in the cross. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, 
Paul writes, he says, But may it never be that I would boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Boy, he, Paul would be a terrible modern Christian because modern Christians boast about everything they do. They boast about how awesome they are. They boast about their Bible knowledge. They boast about what they've done for Christ. They boast about their prophecies. They boast about you know what gifts God has given them. And Paul comes along who really has all those things. And he says, you know what, listen, everything that I've done, I count it as dung, he says, as manure um, for the cause of Christ. The only thing I want to boast in is the fact that Jesus died on the cross for me. Wow, what a powerful thing that is. There is a boasting. We'll follow Jesus no matter what. Listen, the reality is, if you're a good person today, your goodness goes back to Jesus. Apart from the cross, none of us are good. You might say, well, that's, that's sort of a, a, a generalization to say, you know what, the reality is that. I know that apart from Christ in me, there dwells no good thing. It all goes back to the cross. It all goes back to Jesus' work in my life. Yes, there have been people that have invested in me, and I'm thankful for that, but it's the work of Jesus on the cross that's changed me and made me into who I am today. And I'm thankful for the work of the cross in my life. It all goes back to Him. We find our death at the cross, and we find our life at the cross when we come of Him. The blood of the Lamb emanates from that cross. See, it's at the cross that we go and we find that fountain filled with blood flowing from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty states. We are the ones who come into the power of the cross. And the, the blood of the Lamb emanates from the cross. And the reality is our testimony emanates from the cross as well. And who do we overcome the enemy with? Or what do we overcome the enemy with? The blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Man, apart from the cross, we've got nothing. We've got nothing. But thankfully, with the cross, we have the power of God. Do you experience that power of God today? Let me pray with you. Jesus, I pray for each one that's watching this today, that they, Lord, perhaps, maybe if they feel like they haven't experienced the power of the cross, may the power of Jesus flood through them. May the Holy Spirit flood into them today. Let them experience the presence of you and the power that we have that we are not ashamed of, that it is the power of God, this gospel, the power of the cross, is a power that, that saves us. It's a power that delivers us. It's a power that breaks the chains in our lives. It's a power that delivers us. It's a power that moves us and creates in us what God wants us to do and to be. I'm thankful for the message of the cross, the power of the cross. I'm thankful for the old rugged cross in my life. I'm thankful that even though uh, there is a scorn attached to the cross, that, Lord, when we, are, when we receive that scorn, it's just like you did. You received scorn as well, but you went beyond it because you saw what was coming in the days to come. And I'm thankful that through the cross, we have life for today and for the hereafter as well. Lord, bless your people today. Bless us as we close this out this morning in singing this incredible hymn, Deal Over Your Cross. So this great hymn, it was written back a little over a century ago. Uh, the Old Rugged Cross. We don't sing it a whole lot in our churches anymore, but the message is just as true today as it was. And maybe this is a song, maybe you love this song, maybe you haven't heard it in a long time. Maybe it's brand new for you, whatever the case may be. As we sing this first, second, and last verse, uh, just let the truth of it just sort of uh, cover you today. May the Holy Spirit just anoint you with the fresh anointing of that power of the cross in your life today. Amen. On a hill far away, Cherish the love
comes your way, distract you or take you apart. Or may you follow after Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength today. May he bless you and follow with you and give you all that you need to make it through. With great power, with anointing, with the great power of the cross in our lives. Bless you and make you a blessing.